All right, good morning, everyone. Um, so today I'll tell you a little bit about the work my lab does um, looking at ischemic brain injury. Um, we do look at cell death, but we look at a lot more. And so we'll share with you guys a little bit of um, how we sort of look at functional outcomes after these uh, sorts of um, injury. But um, so um, they asked me to do a little bit of an intro, career intro. And so I've sort of framed it around my love for electrophysiology and sort of the approach that my lab uses that I was exposed to pretty early in my research career. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about ischemic cell death and then a couple of our mouse models that we use for ischemia, uh, one for cardiac arrest and one for cerebellar stroke, um, where we're looking at a lot of uh, plasticity deficits and changes in uh, networks um, within the brain. So um, I don't know what level of uh, background everyone is coming from. And so I thought I'd start with just a really basic introduction to the anatomy of the neuron, um, just to sort of get our bearings here uh, in neuroscience. So neurons are really kind of cool, specialized cells in the brain. Um, and what really makes them kind of unique and interesting is how they communicate um, and use uh, electricity or changes in voltage to, to communicate. And so um, neurons have, there's a lot of different kind of types of neurons, but generally neurons receive information um, in these processes here um, that are called dendrites, where they have um, a lot of receptors for different neurotransmitters. That information gets integrated in the soma um, and then determines whether a cell is gonna fire an action potential, which is sort of the binary code of the brain. Um, and today we'll be talking mostly about uh, kind of what are considered multipolar cells where they have dendrites, receive synaptic inputs, um, and then have these axons that connect with other parts of the brain. Um, but I started, um, and, and so, Throughout the neuron, um, they express different types of ion channels. And so this is what allows neurons to have this sort of electrical capacity. Um, and so changes in permeability to different ions happen when there's opening or closing of channels. And there, um, the types of ion channels um, in the brain can be gated in a lot of different ways, either by voltage, ligands, intracellular signals, or for sensory neurons, um, whatever sensory type of uh, information that they, they recognize. Um, and then they open and they open and close and then generate electrical responses in that neuron. Um, some of these can be excitatory or inhibitory. Um, and like I said, they get integrated when, when the cell becomes depolarized, it'll fire an action potential and send that information down to its downstream targets. If information is inhibitory and hyperpolarizes the neuron, they'll be less likely to fire an action potential. So this likelihood of firing an action potential is what we refer to as excitability of a neuron. And so we can look at this, um, these kind of properties of neurons using an approach called electrophysiology. Um, and this is really where we can um, use electrodes that are connected to amplifiers um, to record the activity of single neurons or populations of neurons. Um, some of you guys may be a little bit familiar with this when you think about like EEGs where people wear all these kind of crazy electrodes on their scalp that detect kind of um, population changes of excitability. Um, but all of my um, research and training has really been in this sort of single cell electrophysiology, so recording the activity of an individual um, uh, neuron. And this is just sort of what that setup looks like in reality in the lab, where we have a microscope with our preparation, um, some micro manipulators to be able to kind of really finely approach these cells um, and make contact with them to start to record and then there's always lots of wires um, coming in and out of the uh, out of our out of our setups. So I um, started my uh, research career as an undergrad, um, and I would say fairly late as an undergrad. I'm a first generation uh, college student in my family, and I would say had no clue about research uh, until I was fairly late into my um, undergraduate. Um, and I met uh, this professor, Marie Burns, um, through a friend that actually worked in her lab, um, suggested I, I check out research. Um, and I was at UC Davis, and she was a faculty, a brand new faculty at the Center for Neuroscience. So when I joined her for an internship, she was building her lab, um, which was a really great experience for me to see what that was like. And 
uh, pretty quickly, she gave me what I, in hindsight was a challenging and quite independent project for a, a research assistant in the lab um, where I was recording, um, do, where she started to train me to do electrophysiology and all of our work, all her work fo focused on the kinetics of phototransduction. And so I learned to use suction electrode recording. Um, so this here is a glass pipette. Um, this is a piece of retina and these are rod photoreceptors. Um, and so it, it was quite a fun experience. I did everything in the dark. I used to do dissections with night vision goggles and live in a dark room for eight or 10 hours out of the day. Um, and we would flash light onto these photoreceptors and be able to record their responses to light. And we had a lot of different kind of transgenic or knockout animals to, to study the different molecular components of phototransduction. Um, and this really um, kind of ignited my passion for electrophysiology. I got exposure to other techniques, but this one was really the one that um, made me want to continue doing research. Um, both because it's it just, it, it's such a fun way to study a neuron, um, but also it, I found the kind of instant gratification that comes with it. You know, you sign a flash of light and you see the response right then and there, as opposed to some of the other techniques where it took a few days to get data. So um, this was really uh, uh, something that just resonated really well with me. And one of the other kind of really remarkable things about um, Marie was she was a, young faculty, I'd say at this time, electrophysiology was a fairly male dominated uh, uh, area, um, just not as many women. Um, and she was a trailblazer, both in terms of her science, but also was a great mentor for me. Um, during while I was in her lab, I met and married my husband. And um, when she really encouraged me to go to grad school and when I did, she, the, the best advice she ever gave me is, you know, have a family when you're ready for a family and don't let your career dictate when you do that. And um, that, that for me was um, something that was really valuable, especially because after I left her lab, I had all male mentors. Um, so I went and did my PhD at Oregon Health Science University in Portland. Um, and my advisor was Dr. John Williams. Um, I continued to study sort of G protein receptor regulation as a grad student, um, but more in the context of opioid receptors. And so rather than recording from photoreceptors, I was recording from neurons in the brain and doing pharmacological studies to look at how these receptors responded to high, high concentrations of agonists, which caused desensitization and then that recovery from sensitization. Uh, desensitization and then um, sort of was able to use two photon microscopy to look at the trafficking of those receptors to relate the activity with where they were localized. Um, it was a great place to do a PhD. Um, for those of you that have never been to Portland, the university kind of lives up on a hill um, in this kind of forested area, which was a, quite a cool environment to do my training in. Um, it was in a really great and supportive lab. Um, and John was a great advisor. His, his office was kind of in the lab and he had a rig in his lab and did experiments almost as much as the, the students and postdocs, which again, I don't think I fully appreciated until I left the lab how kind of rare that is. Um, and towards the end of my PhD, um, I had my son, Andrew, which I have to say was quite a challenge as a grad student. And it was John's first time ever having a woman in the lab that had had a kid. Um, so there were some, challenges in terms of how the, I think he thought I was maybe going to fall off the planet and research um, after I had my kid, but I was able to prove him wrong that having a kid is not a career killer. <laughs> um, and then I started, uh, while I was a postdoc, I met, or while I was a pre-doc, I met my future postdoc advisor, Pucker Hurston, um, who was also at OHSU at the time, but during my first year of, his post, of my postdoc got recruited here to the University of Colorado. So I did most of my fellowship um, here in the Department of Anesthesiology under the mentorship of uh, Dr. Herson and Dr. Traceman, who was the former vice chancellor for research here. Uh, one of my first years here, we had quite crazy weather. So this was a tornado that came right over the research building. So. Um, I don't know, I always like to show that picture because it kind of freaked me out when we moved here. Um, but I've continued to do electrophysiology and I would say I've learned quite a few different approaches to do this. Um, 
as my in my uh, pre-doc or during a, a, my graduate years, I was doing one type of electrophysiology called intracellular. Um, when I started working with Paco, I moved to what's called patch clamp recording. Um, and I really focused on two areas of the brain that I'll talk about today. One is the hippocampus, which is a structure that's really important for learning and memory, um, and particularly uh, kind of plasticity in this area, which I'll kind of introduce a little later uh, what that means. Um, and so really learning how to study these, these cells in, in the hippocampus. I also uh, have focused a lot of my research in the cerebellum, which is an area that's really important for motor uh, learning, motor coordination, but also a lot of cognitive uh, functions. Um, and as a postdoc, I had my, my second kid, Natalie. So that's sort of my career trajectory, I would say, um, in terms of how I've gotten to where I am, it's really, I've been very fortunate to have really supportive mentors, both in terms of my research, but in, also in terms of um, my family and then being supportive of, of, of the balance that it takes to, to, um, to try to balance these, these two big parts of my life. Um, but also I have a great partner that, that is um, also very supportive. So I'll stop there in terms of my kind of history and start getting into what my lab studies. So, um, we use uh, two uh, models, or we have several models of brain injury in my lab, but they're really focused around ischemia, which is this idea that when you have a reduction or a loss of blood flow to the brain, um, you lose both oxygen and glucose, which are really um, important for maintaining metabolic function. And the brain is quite unique that there's not any energy reserve. So even brief periods of ischemia can be quite detrimental in the brain. Um, it's natural to all organs, but shorter periods, the, the brain is, is very sensitive to even brief periods of ischemia. And we, we really study this in two kind of contexts. One is what we call a global ischemia, so cardiac arrest, so where there's a loss of perfusion to the entire brain and body. So, and you know, with cardiac arrest, while the brain is um, extremely sensitive, other organs can be damaged and well, uh, as well, and there's actually quite a bit of um, kind of organ crosstalk uh, in terms of signaling that happens. But even though the whole brain becomes ischemic, there's really certain populations of the brain that appear to be particularly vulnerable. Um, and then non-neuronal cells are relatively spared. And people that survive cardiac arrest, you know, certainly there's a huge amount of research and resuscitation science just to you know, be able to bring these people back. But then for those that are resuscitated, they often exhibit deficits in executive, motor, and cognitive function. Um, the other kind of major cause of ischemia that we study is stroke. So this is a more focal loss of blood flow, often due to an arterial occlusion um, of one of the, the, the arteries within the brain. This produces injury. Um, usually with stroke, the duration of ischemia can be quite a bit longer. Um, and because it's quite a bit longer, this produces injury to neurons, glial cells, and the vasculature, result, resulting in a, a true infarct, so a, like a total loss of brain tissue. And I'll, you'll see some examples of that um, once we get into some data here. Um, but people with stroke also deficit, uh, exhibit um, similar deficits to what we see in cardiac arrest, although um, it may be a little bit more dependent on where uh, where the stroke is. So you, people may have motor deficits without cognitive deficits or vice versa, um, really depending on where the occlusion happened. And so when there is ischemia, um, what ends up happening is there is a, a failure of um, a lot of the ion transporters that live on the neuron that keep maintain these ionic balances that are really critical for how a neuron functions. Um, and what ends up happening is there is an excess of the excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate um, that causes activation of a lot of different um, receptors and voltage-gated channels and causes a pathophysiological increase in calcium. Um, and this can cause uh, my, uh, organelle dysfunction, activation of um, cell death pathways, um, oxidative stress that all can ultimately lead to neuronal cell death. And so today we'll talk a little bit about the neuronal cell death piece, um, just to kind of give you an idea of what that looks like in our injury models, but really we're quite interested in what happens to the cells that don't die. And is there a way to improve their function, um, to increase, uh, to improve neurological deficits after cardiac arrest or stroke? 
Um, and so I'm part of a, a group called the Neuronal Injury Program, um, which is sort of a way to describe a collaboration of a lot of faculty across multiple departments. And we're all quite interested in, in ischemic brain injury in various contexts. Um, so we're certainly interested in sort of the mechanisms of, of how cell death happens and whether we can intervene and actually reduce cell death. But also, we're very interested in the role of sex hormones and the impact of, of biological sex on uh, outcomes. Um, and we're also quite interested in how development or being in different stages of development affect injury. And we have quite a few pediatric clinicians in our group that unfortunately see kids who have uh, early life events that lead to ischemia. Um, that may be asphyxial cardiac arrest, um, neonatal stroke, these sort of things that unfortunately, while not super as common as they are in adults are, are more common than we um, care to see. And really, you know, the, the idea that children are not just small adults, so we really need to have animal models that, um, that, that are appropriate to, to study what's happening at these developmental stages. And then what my talk, talk mostly is focused on today are electrophysiolo out, electrophysiological outcomes as important measures of function um, to identify therapeutic targets. Um, so this again, just sort of shows the pathways that we kind of think about as driving neuronal injury. Um, but again, we're quite interested in what happens to the neurons that survive. And so I'll start with our cardiac arrest model. Um, so we perform cardiac arrest in mice um, and have some quite talented uh, research assistants that do these kind of uh, in vivo surgical procedures to be able to uh, do instrumentation of mice, um, to be able to intubate them, get access to a jugular uh, IV line. Um, we do very rigorous temperature management um, because we know that temperature can impact injury outcomes. Um, and we have the mice uh, connected to an EKG so we can um, see both when we've um, induced asystole, but also once we've successfully resuscitated. Um, and we're able to do this in quite small animals, as little as nine or 10 grams, to be able to kind of model uh, what we term juvenile cardiac arrest. So we stop the heart with a IV injection of potassium chloride. Um, we allow the mouse to say, um, sorry, this is a lot of it. Um, so the mouse will have a rest for eight minutes and then we begin resuscitation, um, just like we kind of do with people, chest compressions, ventilation, oxygen, and epinephrine. Um, typically, uh, we're able to resuscitate within two minutes of initiation of CACPR. Um, if we're not successful within that time, um, that animal would get excluded from the study because we do try to have quite a, a, a narrow range of duration of ischemia, so we don't have a high amount of variability in our studies. Um, and uh, we kind of call our procedure area a little mouse ICU because we do have to provide quite a bit of post-operative support for the first three days. As you can imagine, they're quite sick after having had um, a cardiac arrest and it takes them a day or two to really get back to ambulating. Um, and mice recover remar remarkably well from these sort of things, but um, it does take a, a bit of uh, helping them along to, to, to get them to the time points where we're really interested in studying them. And two of the areas that we've really focused on in this animal model are, again, the hippocampus and the cerebellum. And that's primarily because we've seen from um, human his autopsies that these seem to be the areas that have the most amount of cell death. And that includes the CA1 pyramidal layer of the hippocampus, a particular cell within the cerebellum called Purkinje cells. Um, there's also quite a significant amount to uh, brain cells within the striatum, but we study that a, a little bit less in our lab. Um, and even within these sensitive areas, not all the neurons die. And so these are some um, kind of histological readouts of injury. So on the left here is the hippocampus and these sort of lighter colored cells uh, that have really nice, where you can see the plasma membrane or, or live healthy neurons. And then these really dark guys that we call kind of pycnotic um, are the cells that have died. And um, for the duration of cardiac arrest that we induce, we see about 50 or 60% loss of CA1 neurons in the hippocampus, um, but still a good number that survive. I um, mean, we can record from these cells, so they are um, healthy 
neurons for the most part. We will talk about how they differ from sort of a, an animal that has not had any sort of injury. Uh, and then the other area, this shows cerebellum. So um, this one is a stain for these Purkinje cells. And normally when we look at this, we see these big kind of round red balls will have a very nice um, uninterrupted layer within the cerebellum. And after cardiac arrest, we see these big gaps in the cerebellar or Purkinje cells um, indicating that they've, they've died and been removed from the, from the um, or cleared away from the, from the cortex. Um, and we have, we've published lots of papers on mechanisms and cell death and neuroprotection. Um, but what we really started to wanna know is can these neurons that survive function similar or, or make up for the cells that have, that have lost. And so one of the ways that we look at this in the hippocampus is to study synaptic plasticity, which is really a, a cellular mechanism that underlies learning and memory. Um, and we particularly focus on long-term potentiation, which is the idea that you get a persistent increase in the efficacy of a synapse. Or, um, and we, use, we induce LTP with high frequency stimulation, but we're walking around, this is really driven by firing um, of neurons that are providing sensory information into the, the hippocampus. And so essentially we have um, dendrites that express postsynaptic receptors for the neurotransmitter glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. Um, and when, neuro, um, when glutamate gets released from presynaptic terminals, into this area of the dendrite, it will activate either AMPA receptors and or NMDA receptors, which are glutamate receptors. When both of these get activated concurrently, which requires kind of a high degree or a high, high level of stimulation, um, we get calcium increases that drive phosphorylation of the AMPA receptors and insertion and stabilization so that we get a stronger response to future uh, glutamate signals. And the way that we record this is to make uh, brain slice preparations um, where we can extract the brain, um, keep it alive with an artificial cerebral spinal fluid um, and slice it um, in the proper orientation to be able to record these, uh, the synaptic circuit. And so the, the part of the hippocampus that we focus on is the CA1. Um, information enters the, CA, the hippocampus uh, through the dentate gyrus pathway um, that information gets transmitted to the CA3, and then the CA3 is what is sending these glutamate signals to the CA1 pyramidal cells. And if we stick a recording electrode into the slice, um, we can record the activity of uh, groups of these CA1 cells um, when we stimulate the CA3 with an electrical stimulator. And so this here is an example of what that response looks like. So um, the white is our kind of... Uh, baseline response. So we uh, have a baseline, we stimulate, that gives us a little stimulus artifact, and then that is what triggers the release of glutamate. And then when that glutamate gets detected on these postsynaptic receptors, we get what's called an excitatory postsynaptic response um, or postsynaptic potential. Um, and that's this kind of deflection in the voltage that we see here. If we then deliver what we call a theta burst stimulation, which is a, a form of a high frequency stimulation, and then record that same response, we see that it's increased in amplitude. And so this is what we're describing as long-term potentiation. So this sustained increase in synaptic strength after a high frequency stimulation. So when we do this in animals that have undergone cardiac arrest, we see that they've lost the ability to potentiate. And again, these are in the neurons that have survived the initial injury. So We've done this experiment at multiple time points. And when we do this in an animal that's had kind of a sham surgery, so it's had anesthesia and been instrumentated, but didn't have its heart stopped, um, we see that they potentiate to about 160% of the initial um, baseline amplitude. And when we do this experiment hours um, to weeks after we see that they are no longer able to increase beyond their initial amplitude. And, um, I guess I didn't say this when I was describing the cell death piece, but in cardiac arrest, most of the cell death is done in about three days. So once we're recording at seven or 30 days after the injury, we really are recording what is the sort of stable surviving network. And so really we think about this as sort of a, a double whammy, right? Not only are you killing the cells, a good portion of the cells in this brain region, but then the ones that survive are not able to 
to function um, in a way that supports learning and memory. Um, we think that part of the reason for this is that the ischemia itself drives a lot of similar types of signals that our high frequency stimulation does, except for in a much less synapse specific way. And so when we have um, a loss of, as I mentioned earlier, when we have kind of this energy failure, there's ends up being a lot of glutamate in the extracellular space that activates NMDA receptors. Um, it drives membrane depolarization and calcium influxes, which for some cells, you know, drives them to die. But for cells that survive, um, we think that it actually um, drives them to potentiate their synapses, preventing the ability, kind of occluding the ability for kind of physiological plasticity to happen. Um, and we've demonstrated this a few ways. One is through showing that a lot of the changes that happen in response to LTP happen with um, ischemia alone. And so that is phosphorylation or activation of this uh, calcium chemical. I'm sorry, I'm on the slides are auto advancing. Um, uh, CAMK2, which is one of the proteins that phosphorylates anchor receptors, we see its activity becomes increased after cardiac arrest. And we also see there's an increased phosphorylation of glutamate receptors, which would, uh, which is similar to what we see with LTP. Um, but these animals have only had a cardiac arrest. And so um, we could also measure this with electrophysiology. Uh, recording uh, the amper of mediated responses, which are these little downward deflections here that have the little asterisks next to them. And when we look at the amplitudes of these, we see that um, they've increased relative to sham, again, suggesting that cardiac arrest is inducing some form of potentiation of these synapses um, relative to a, a naive animal. And so the question we have is, um, or we had is, you know, if, if both ischemia or physiological stimulation can drive this potentiation. Um, is that blocking the ability to potentiate with more when you want to, when you're trying to learn something? And can we kind of reset the synapses, um, right? So this is a, a bi-directional process. Synapses can be potentiated and they can also be what we call depotentiated or depressed um, to kind of be able to have ability to have these dynamics of, of learning and memory. And so um, we can induce depotentiation with a low frequency stimulation rather than a high frequency stimulation. And normally if you do this low frequency stimulation in a naive animal, um, you get a little bit of uh, initial potentiation, but no, no sustained potentiation beyond the baseline. When we do this in animals that have had a cardiac arrest, we see actually a decrease in the synaptic strength, which again, indicates that maybe they were already in a potentiated state. And so then if we do that low frequency stimulation, and this is an animal that has had a cardiac arrest, we do the low frequency stimulation and depotentiate the synapses. We've now kind of recovered the ability of these synapses to then respond to a more physiological high frequency stimulation. Um, and we've not done this in vivo to see how this affects learning and memory, um, but um, we at least think that ex vivo, this indicates that we may have some uh, changes in uh, synaptic strength that are potentially reversible and targetable. Um, and I'm sorry, I forgot to mention when I started my talk, please feel free to interrupt me along the way if you guys have any questions. Um, no need to wait till the end. And so once we realize that this deficit is maybe reversible, we've started to try to identify ways to pharmacologically target this. And um, we've done this with a couple ways. One is through a specific ion channel that we know gets activated specifically by oxidative stress um, and that has sustained activation in the post ischemic brain. Um, and if we inhibit this ion channel trypam2, um, we've also inhibited a specific form of the inhibitory GABA receptors we can both reverse the LTP deficits, but also improve um, memory performance in, in some of our behavioral tasks. One of the interesting things that we've learned from doing these sort of injury models at different stages of development um, is that there is potentially the ability to recover this in other ways. And one of 
one of the studies that we've done is to do cardiac arrest in young animals. So these are uh, kind of pre-adolescent equivalents, um, pre pubertal adolescents. And if we give them cardiac arrest, they also have this similar LTP deficit that we see in adults that's shown here in the black bars. But if we let these animals um, live and wait until a month after the cardiac arrest to do this experiment, we see that they've recovered endogenously. And that's not something that we saw in the adults. Um, you know, if we did the same experiment in a 30 day, this is all juvenile, but if we did this in an adult at 30 days, we still see this low level of plasticity. And one of the things that's happening between seven and 30 days, um, and really that's about going from one month to a two month old mouse is puberty. Right? So they have a hormonal onset that happens in rodents at about four or five weeks. And if we block puberty by overectomizing females, we block their recovery of plasticity. So we think that there is something about the hormonal surge that happens um, during adolescence into the teen years or equivalent of teen years of a mouse. Um, that supports some recovery of function in this circuit. Um, so this is overactivizing, showing that we block the recovery relative to its 30-day comparator that had a cardiac arrest that's hormonally intact. And if we, when we overactivize, if we give back estrogen at the time of overectomy, so we kind of mimic puberty, we still see we see that these animals then have full recovery. So one some of the studies that were, were interested in pursuing now that we've learned what a interesting role hormones may play is whether we can use this this sort of surge of hormones in an adult to help support recovery of the hippocampal function and so those are some of the studies that we have sort of future and ongoing in our lab is um, give a bolus of estrogen in the post ischemic period to see if we get some recovery of synaptic function and we think that this is likely um, estrogen is known to drive uh, uh, transcription of some plasticity related genes, such as uh, brain derived neurotrophic factor, which we know is um, reduced after brain injury. Um, so we think it's kind of changing overall gene expression to help kind of recover some of the synaptic function that is lost after cardiac arrest. We've also studied plasticity in this other part of the brain, the cerebellum. Um, and this is the, the more prominent form of plasticity in this is depression as opposed to potentiation. So rather than getting an increase in synaptic strength, we get a decrease in synaptic strength when there's a certain type of uh, uh, sensory and error signal that comes into this part of the brain. It's a calcium dependent process like what we see in the hippocampus. It's just sort of the opposite direction. Um, and this, this plasticity is really thought to ask, uh, underlie a lot of aspects of cerebellar dependent learning. And similar to what we saw in the hippocampus, um, we saw here, again, we're going from a, a, a large response prior to this uh, high frequency or to, uh, concurrent stimulation to a smaller reduction. Um, so controls, animals have a depression when we stimulate two of their inputs, the parallel fiber and the climbing fiber together. Um, but when we do this in animals that have had a cardiac arrest, we see that they've lost their ability to potentiate um, relative to their control shams. And in this brain region, the, the mechanism for the loss is slightly different than what we saw in the hippocampus. We actually saw that this, uh, cardiac arrest actually reduced the expression of one of the receptors that drives uh, calcium influx that's required for, for, for LTD. Um, and that that is down at all the, it's, it's, it's a, function is reduced at all of the times where we're seeing um, impaired uh, plasticity. Um, and so that, again, we, we think we have a, a, maybe a novel pharmacological ta target of trying to increase their activity um, at delayed time points to restore some of the cerebellar function. Um, so we have a, quite a few projects in our lab looking at, at cardiac arrest and the role of sex hormones in LTP. Um, so we do a lot of gonadectomy, gonadectomy and hormone replacement um, in males and females to try to get at which maybe specific receptors um, dry, are driving this recovery of function in, in, in juveniles that are allowed to mature to adulthood. Um, and we do a lot of kind of pharmacology and conditional 
um, receptor knockouts to get at some of these mechanisms. We've also started to look at another part of the brain that doesn't have direct cell death, but we think is likely affected by cardiac arrest, which is the amygdala. Um, it plays a really important role in fear and anxiety. And we know that people that, uh, patients that su survive cardiac arrest have increased anxiety. Um, and one of the graduate students in our lab is really starting to develop models to look at amygdala uh, function and plasticity um, as part of his developing thesis project. Um, so I'm going to shift gears before I switch to stroke. Um, does anyone have any questions related to the cardiac arrest portion of the talk? I uh, can save them for the end, but I thought I'd take a little pause here. Nothing in the chat. I will keep going. Um, so as I mentioned, um, cardiac arrest is one form of one cause of, of ischemia in the brain. Um, and probably one of the more common um, forms of ischemia is actually a stroke, right? And so this is the idea that there's a focal occlusion of, of an artery in the brain. And the majority of these tend to happen actually in the forebrain. Um, so parts of the brain like the motor cortex or striatum. Um, but a lot of my research in cardiac arrest started to look at the cerebellum. And as I was, Reading the literature, I realized there, um, while there was very little uh, studies to look at it, that strokes can happen in the cerebellum as, as well. And so the cerebellum lives in the hindbrain. Um, it's supplied by different um, arteries than the forebrain. Um, these uh, cerebellar arteries that arise from the vertebral artery. And while it's a relatively small percentage of all strokes, there's a lot of strokes every year in the US, about 800,000 um, new or recurring strokes. Um, so about 20 to 25,000 of those uh, occur within the cerebellum. And what's been really interested me in the clinical literature is um, while they do have symptoms like that you would predict for an, a motor area, like ataxia, um, patients sometimes display vertigo, um, impaired motor learning, there's also been a really interesting um, emergence of literature showing that the cerebellum also can play an important role in more cognitive functions. And when they've done lesion, lesion symptom mapping studies, they show a correlation of motor symptoms with um, more anterior portions of the cerebellum, um, while areas with the posterior areas, so anterior being this more kind of towards the front of the head brain, um, with posterior causing more cognitive and emotional dysfunction. But it's really unclear why um, or how injury in the cerebellum can cause some of these cognitive impairments. And so there were no mouse models at the time to study cerebellar strokes. So we developed one in my lab a few years ago using an approach called photothrombosis. And so really this is the idea that we can use light to make a stroke. Um, and so we can inject a compound called rose bengal that when um, it gets uh, illuminated by a particular wavelength of light um, causes the formation of reactive oxygen species and activates platelets to form a clot. So this is um, from a paper where they did this under, uh, while they were visualizing blood vessels, um, irradiated. Yeah, there's no dairy in it. I'm sorry. Um, and here shows that once they've done that irradiation, they get a loss of blood flow downstream from that clot. So we've done this now, and this has been really well established approach to create um, strokes in the forebrain, but just no one's really applied it to this particular brain region. Um, and so when we, uh, we can do this under a stereotaxic procedure. So that means we head fix the mouse under anesthesia, um, expose the skull, and then illuminate through the skull. And we can target the superior cerebellar artery that supplies blood to the majority of the cerebellar cortex. And we can localize this light to either um, illuminate either more anterior portions of this artery or posterior portions to try to, try to model what, what the clinical data is showing of, you know, people can have strokes anywhere in the cerebellum, but can we confine it to anterior or posterior and, and see similar data to what people have shown in, in clinical symptoms? So this is an example of what the injury looks like after we do one of these um, 
photothrombotic surgeries. Um, and so this kind of light acellular area of these histological sections is where our infarct is. And we um, can show that we can really nicely confine it to either the anterior cerebellum or the posterior cerebellum just by targeting our light differently. Um, and we can see that in MRI as well, um, that we can, we can see very visible um, necrosis of the brain um, where, we, where we've caused the stroke. Um, and this is just showing a little bit of what, this, what that looks like at a little higher resolution um, in some of the areas kind of surrounding this, this complete necrotic area. So we've done neurobehavioral testing in animals that had either this anterior localized infarct or posterior localized and are able to see, um, to dissociate motor and cognitive deficits. So um, we have a couple ways of, of looking at, at motor function and, and cognitive function. Um, and the two that I'm showing here are balance beam and what's known as contextual fear conditioning. So the balance beam is, basically what it sounds like. We put the mice on a, a narrow tapered balance beam and let them cross into a darkened goal box. Um, and then we can videotape them from below and just count how many times they miss. Right? So are they kind of fumbling their way across this uh, balance beam? And um, you know, healthy mice make a mistake or two here and there. Animals that had injury in this more anterior parts of the cerebellum showed a higher number of missteps, indicating that they have a little bit of motor coordination deficits, whereas the posterior mice were much like much less likely to um, exhibit any sort of motor deficit. On the other hand, when we look at um, a, a memory task, which is contextual fear conditioning, and in this task, we put the mouse in a, an environment with visual cues um, and deliver a, a mild foot shock. And then we put them back in their home cage and bring them back into that uh, context 24 hours later. Um, if they remember this context as having been aversive, um, they'll freeze. And that's what we see in our sham animals. Once they get into this, they really kind of don't move around a lot because they don't know what's coming and, and they have a little bit of fear about, about that context. Um, reduced freezing in this task suggests reduced memory of that context. And so in the animals that had this posterior localized stroke, we do see that they have a poorer memory of the context compared to shams or the animals that have anterior. And so this really gives us a tool now to try to get at how, how one, you know, we can study motor deficits, but we're really quite interested in how, how do cognitive deficits happen after an injury in the cerebellum. And this overly complicated um, schematic just shows that there is a, the, the cerebellum is really highly connected with a lot of other parts of the brain um, and can regulate functions of a lot of different areas. And the one, that, again, that we kind of are interested in both because of our other studies that we've done and, and the tools that we have in our lab is the hippocampus. And there's been a good amount of literature showing that the cerebellum and hippocampus interact and that changing activity in the cerebellum can alter hippocampal function. And in fact, people have done um, studies where they've um, altered activity of the cerebellum to change uh, temporal lobe epilepsy frequency, um, or have, and, and others have shown that if you stimulate the cerebellum, you can actually improve motor function after a, a cortical stroke. Um, but there's a lot of uh, kind of intermediate steps between the cerebellum and hippocampus. But we wanted to say, you know, one of the questions we have is, is the hippocampus affected when we make an injury in the cerebellum? And the answer is yes, for animals that have had this injury in this more cognitive areas of the cerebellum. And so this is the same kind of experiment I was showing you in my cardiac arrest data, um, where um, we record the synaptic activity um, in the hippocampus, deliver a high frequency stimulation and see potentiation of that synapse. Um, and we see nice potentiation in our sham controls and in animals that had this more anterior um, localized injury, which again caused motor, but not a memory deficit. Um, and we see they have normal hippocampal plasticity and there's no injury to cells in the hippocampus in this model. Um, Whereas the animals that had the more posterior localized, which again, these animals had memory deficits, we see a, um, a unilateral impairment of the 
uh, LTP. And the unilateral nature of this is somewhat expected because the cerebellum um, is connected to the contralateral hippocampus. And so we're seeing um, contralateral to our injury is, is where we're seeing these deaths. Um, and we, we're doing some molecular studies now. We've seen downregulation of some key genes that are important for plasticity um, in some array studies. So we're confirming those findings and seeing whether we can target um, some of these pathways to, to restore memory function and whether that improves or plasticity and whether that improves memory function. Um, but as I showed you here, there's quite a bit between the hippocampus and thalamus. So how does this change in the cerebellum get transmitted to the hippocampus? And so one of the students in my lab, um, Miriam, is really trying to focus on a, 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 the, the nuclei in the brain that has been shown to connect these two regions, which is the thalamus. Um, we do see that the cerebellum um, one of the interesting things with this is the, the cells that are dying in the cerebellar cortex are sending inhibitory drive um, to a nuclei that then projects to the thalamus. And so we would imagine we've lost inhibition and we have some evidence that's, that's driving hyperexcitability um, or increased firing of the output of the cerebellum. And we've done this with a stain called CFOS, which actually Rachel is, is kind of following up these preliminary findings during her internship to show, um, to try to address the question of does activity of the neurons that are leaving the cerebellum um, and going to the forebrain, are they changed after injury? And we think that they're increased. And then does that affect the downstream thalamic nuclei? Um, and there's a good amount of precedent for changes in this thalamic nuclei and particularly in how it fires. So if you remember me saying excitability is this um, kind of a way to describe the likelihood that a neuron is gonna fire an action potential. Um, is it changed in our, in our cerebellar stroke? And others have shown in a variety of other disease models, including cortical stroke, that um, there can be hyper excitability of this network and that can drive a lot of uh, neurological deficits. And so, um, Miriam has been recording the firing of these neurons in the thalamus using whole cell recording. Um, and then she can um, record from the neurons and stimulate them to fire action potentials and then quantify how many they fire with these different levels of stimulation. Um, these cells also fire what's called a rebound action potential, which is um, really that they get um, hyperpolarized. So they are less likely to fire an action potential, but when they come back to rest, they give this little burst. And these two types of firing are really, um, without getting too much into the weeds, are really important for overall thalamic function. Um, and when we look at their firing after our cerebellar stroke, we see that there is a, a increased excitability um, in the hemisphere that, that receives input from the cerebellum that's injured relative to the non-injured cerebellum suggesting that there is, again, increased output of the cerebellum and maybe changes in the thalamic excitability of downstream neurons. And this is observed both in their tonic firing, so the firing that happens when we depolarize, as well as the rebound firing, which is the firing that happens after we hyperpolarize and then come back to a resting potential. Um, and we think that this hyperexcitability is driven by upregulation of a specific uh, calcium channel that is highly expressed in these cells and drives their rebound firing. Um, and so we're uh, doing some SHRNA studies at the moment to knock down expression and see if we restore normal excitability of the circuit. Um, so for the cerebellar stroke, we have a lot of, I think, unanswered questions once we've started to sort of delve into how this injury can affect other brain regions. Um, you know, can we restore the LTP in the hippocampus to improve memory is something we're very interested in. Um, we're very interested in how this hyperexcitability of this thalamic nuclei um, is, is how that's caused. And then can we also target that to improve function um, and then working our way back to the cerebellum and really understanding what's happening there um, in terms of the non-injured cells that survive the, the, the stroke. So, um, I hope that kind of gives you an overview of sort of the approaches my lab uses and the types of questions we're trying to get at. Um, I would say, you know, all of these studies have really let us 
to, to believe that we really are on the right track by using this electrophysiological approach to try to get at the overall network of, that survives the injury. Um, because unfortunately, a lot of the strategies that have been um, worked successfully in rodents to reduce the cell deaths haven't translated well in clinic. Um, and there's also very narrow windows for intervention, particularly with stroke. So if we can find ways to improve function at more um, delayed time points after the injury, we think we can have a larger impact on functional outcomes. Um, so I have a great group of people that I work with. Um, this was our holiday party a few years ago when we were still able to do things in, in person. Um, I'll highlight a couple people. Um, Nick Chalmers and Erica Tymeyer have been our really talented cardiac arrest surgeons. Um, Crystal Minharev, um, and I don't see where she is in here. My student, Miriam Moreno, have really driven the cerebellar stroke project. Um, and we're excited that Rachel's been a part of that this summer. Um, and of course, we thank the people that help fund the science that we do. Um, thank you guys for your attention. And I'd be happy to take any questions the last uh, eight to 10 minutes that we have here.